And at this time, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our visitors from India, and especially the esteemed Dr. Indu Shahani, who is the chair of the Indian School of Design and Innovation and the Indian School of Management at India. If you would please greet her with a warm welcome. So warm welcome to all of you. It's good afternoon to you and a good evening to all my panelists and my guests in India. Can you all hear us? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's it. So that's a great thing. Let me first of all thank my two friends right here, uh, Daryl Rand and the president of NJCU, uh, Sue Henderson, for this exceptional evening and a super conference that you've organized here. Thank you so much. And can I ask my Indian friends to give them a warm applause? And let me also thank everyone back home, especially Dean Mukesh Patel, who's the host for the evening. Thank you so much for organizing the evening. And panelists, thank you so much. It's uh, while you're still going to have your lunch, they also have to have their dinner. So we hope to finish this within an hour. And uh, we are very, very happy to have such excellent uh, panelists here. So I want to start with an Indian saying, which goes, Sanskrita Stri Parashakti, which means an enlightened woman is a source of infinite strength. And we've seen this in India always. The women have held special positions. First of all, to begin with, most of the goddesses are women. You had the Indian prime minister as a woman. You have the president as a woman. And you've, of course, now got the leader of the opposition as a woman. So we've, had, we've done that much before some of the advanced countries where women have been very, very active in politics. We now have women on boards, and this is mandatory, so we most of the boards have got women. We also have reservation for women in the electorate. So it's good to see and heartening to see that women are in the forefront. However, let me tell you as the dean of a college, I have been noticing my students for years, and when I look at the dean's list, out of the top 10, invariably eight, nine, and sometimes all 10 are women. And this is where the young girls are doing so well. And I must compliment them because as the earlier speaker said, girls work harder and they definitely get there. So with this, let me say that the three dimensions for any country to move ahead are inclusiveness, women parity, and responsible industry. A recent ENY report says that India is currently at 7.5% and 8% GDP growth, which is one of the highest in the world. But it can actually move ahead if we give a boost to women parity, and if there is more women participation in the workforce. The GDP will rise by US $700 billion. And this would be a jump of 1% GDP, almost taking it to 10%, which would be the highest in the world. So it's women parity, women empowerment that India is pushing for. So let's look at it, how the two countries are matching this up. Let me first introduce, I'm going to introduce one panelist from here and one panelist from the other end. Let me take this pleasure of introducing our first panelist, Radhika Prabhu. She's the senior policy advisor 
Officer of Office of Global Women Issues, U.S. Department of State. We are very, very proud of you, Radhika. And I must say, she focuses on expanding inclusive security and growth in South Asia. Give her a big warm applause, ladies and gentlemen. On the other hand, we have another Radhika. And this Radhika, Radhika Nath, the one who's sitting in the center, is the president of the Ladies Wing of Indian Merchants Chambers. We are very happy that they have joined hands with us to host this evening. Radhika has over 25 years of experience in the retail industry, export, and trade. She has played an important role in developing Mahindra Group retail strategy and is currently a part of the management team for Mom and Me, which is the maternity development for the Mahindra retail company. I want to just say one more thing about Radhika. She's had some amazing programs while she's been the president, but not only just that, she actually looks after a school where over 700 students are there, not so privileged, and she has introduced innovating teaching technologies in that school. Give a big warm applause to Radhika Nath, the president of the Ladies' Wing of IMC. Let's go next back to this side. And we have a brave gentleman here, <laughs> right? Rajiv, I'm really intrigued. And don't, don't, don't underestimate this gentleman. He is a litigation partner, all right? And he's a trial attorney. He's got substantial experience in complex commercial disputes, intellectual property litigation, franchisee disputes, technology law, large-scale construction disputes, and constitutional challenges. Rajiv Parikh is involved with a variety of election-related litigation for New Jersey. So he's going to be a great match for all you five women. Welcome, Rajiv Parikh. Thank you. <laughs> we now have Abanti Sankranarayan, who's been a very, very good friend of mine. She's the chief strategy and corp. I think, Abanti, just raise your hand so everybody can see that's you, all right? So she is the um, chief strategy and corporate affairs officer, USL Diageo Company. Um, outstanding track record of over 20 years in the consumer industry, and she has been the managing director of Diageo India since July 2012. She till she took on this new role of being Chief Strategy and Corporate Affairs in the United Spirits Limited. Uh, it's interesting to note that we have something in common. She's the first lady to be the managing director of an international spirits company, and I've been the first lady to be on her board. So we have this in common. And I have to, have to also tell you that she is passionate about diversity and inclusivity in India. She works very hard on the CSR initiatives. She's involved a lot of young students into responsible drinking. And she has just been featured in the impact as the 50 most influential women in India in 2015. Welcome, Abandi, please. Now let's go on to Anjali, the young, lovely, charming girl. And you wouldn't know what she's doing. Be very careful when you speak in front of her, because Anjali is the deputy managing editor and reporter of NJ Biz, focusing all things on business, diversity, and healthcare. That's interesting to see that in, the, in Garden State. Previously, she has been a broad broadcast journalist in Washington, DC. A lovely young lady. We would love to have media who are so beautiful. Let's welcome Anjali. And of course, my most favorite, and that's Anita Bilani. Anita, please raise a hand. That's Anita, welcome her. She's the chief people officer. You know, she's so soft-spoken, sometimes I wonder how could she be really be the chief people officer. So she's the chief people officer 
uh, in Gaja Capital, 29 years of experience as a business leader and a senior human capital professional. She has previously been a partner with BMR Advisors, Managing Director of Russell Reynolds, uh, Reynolds Associates in India, many, many important jobs. And let me tell you one more thing about her. She is an ICF accredited uh, executive coach, and for 15 years she's been coaching. We are very happy that she is working in the same building, the same campus where our institutions are, and I can see how many students and staff she's going to nurture and coach. Thank you so much, Anita. Thank you so much for being here. We thought of you. Let's welcome her. We thought of you first because we knew that you have to just take the elevator and come down to our program. So with this, I'm going to ask one first round of quick question to all of them. And they've got such distinguished uh, CVs here and, and such great work experiences. Very quickly, because we've got one hour and we're going to go through about three sets of questions. So one hour. So let's go through one first quick question. All of you are working and look very, very, very happy and excited about your job. So can you just tell us in one sentence, what is it that's most exciting about your jobs? To begin with, I'm going to give you a clue. If somebody asks me that, as a professor, uh, what is it that excites you the most? And I'm sure, Sue, you know what we would say, the students. When we go to the classroom and we see the students, we are energized. And I think that's the most exciting part of being in the, in the teaching profession. All yours, Radhika, you can start off and then I'll go across to them. Um, I work in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department. And I think one of the most exciting things about my job is going into the office and knowing that our primary duty is to elevate women's issues uh, as a component of US foreign policy. And covering South Asia, that is uh, a tough region. And it's one where I think our embassies and our diplomats are doing an incredible job to advance this work. So it makes me very excited. Good. Rajiv. Uh, so what I love about my job is actually very simple. It's something I learned from my mom, is that you really need to be a trailblazer in whatever you do. and with. The type of law that I've been able to practice and the colleagues that I have, some of whom are here, I've been able to be on the forefront of issues that I find very intellectually challenging and I think are important for civil rights and other issues throughout the country. I'm going to piggyback off of that. It's the challenging part. Um, it's challenging and I like to joke that I love being the annoying person. I love the idea of getting to ask the questions and hold someone accountable. I was always a really inquisitive child. And so to get paid to do that for the rest of my life is actually quite amazing. <laughs> so let's go across to you. Anita, you could start off all three of you then. Uh, I work in private equity. and. Uh, the satisfaction comes from really growing the companies that I'm involved in, making you know, that impact that comes with uh, ultimately making a lot of money for the companies as well as for us as investors. So just the whole process of working with these companies, growing the talent, growing the business, you know, helping the promoters through that, it's really exciting for me. Radhika? Um, I've been working um, in exports and uh, with the, with the um, Indian opening, Indian market opening up to our local imports also and local market here, retail market. And I think what was very exciting for me was charting the organized retail section here because everything, I think 95% of our markets are still unorganized in the disorganized sector with our small Kirana shops and pop and mom stores. So it's been a lovely experience getting into the strategy, how to go about it, how to get into retail and very, very fulfilling because we're in a space where it's mom and the child. And India has, I think, the largest percentage of under 25 year olds. So we have a big market we're looking at right now. So it's very exciting to be there to do that. Avanti. Yeah, so um, I work for an alcohol company uh, in India. In fact, India's largest alcohol company. 
And uh, India has a very interesting, complex, love-hate relationship with alcohol. And what I find very exciting in my job is that in a small way, or perhaps in not such a small way, uh, I'm actually helping change the perception and attitude towards alcohol in this country. Um, whether it's policymakers, whether it is uh, consumers or society at large, I think what I do is changing and shifting um, how alcohol is seen in this country, and that's very exciting. I also get the opportunity, therefore, to, to meet a very diverse group of people, uh, which is always very interesting uh, for me. Good. Thank you. I think, Abanti, you do have a tough job there. And, and India is very, very complex, and every state has its own practices for alcohol, and a lot of them are not even in, encouraging, and there's prohibition, and she is doing a fabulous job at that, I must say. Right, so I'm going to start. Anita said she's making a lot of money, but she's not just doing that. Let me tell you what Anita is doing. She's actually creating a lot of talent. I know this because she helped me when I was doing staff recruitments. So Anita, the first question to you. Talent is key to business success. Could you comment on the talent pool and skill sets available in India, especially considering that India has the youngest demographics? We have about 50% of India's population under the age of 25. How are we going to you know, hone this talent? What are, you, what are you thinking of? So, you know, one of the things that is uh, very interesting that people think about it and they say that you know this is a country with 1.3 billion people which is true uh, it's about how many of these people are really employed and that's where the gap is i think what has happened in india is that uh, we have a very large population of young people so the average age in india is 25 and so you know we have this big bulge of the population between 15 and 57 i think and we are, you know, in this demographic, we have this demographic dividend. Uh, but the gap is that even though we have this demographic dividend, more people doesn't mean that we have the right skills and the right kind of people, you know, that are coming into the, into the, into the businesses. So uh, while we do have an educated population, I don't think we have a skilled population that is employable. And that's the problem. You know, that's the, that's the problem that we have. And what's really happening is that if you go and speak to uh, business leaders, the, the typical question that they will always ask you is, where do I get this talent from? And at the same time, we have this demographic dividend. So where is the gap? And the gap is that our talent is not ready. It's not ready to be employed. And while we do have some people that, you know, it's actually a statistic I read, which is very mind boggling, is that 0.01% of the population that is employable is ready to be employed. So, you know, what really is lacking in our population is the skills and the readiness to be, you know, employed. And, you know, there are several programs that the government has started in the sense of make in India, skill India. Uh, typically what happens is uh, we go to college, we come out, we don't know what to do, and we lose steam. So it's about really building the right skills because if you really look at the business world, you know there are uh, it's an ever-changing landscape, and you know there are so many different types of factors that play into how businesses are now globalized, digitalized. Uh, there are so many things that are happening in this world. So some of the skills that we need to build very quickly are digital skills, agility, global mindset, and I think. Um, as India grows and as India, you know, uh, is growing, like you pointed out, that we are looking at 10% GDP growth, this becomes very important for us. So the talent is there, it's just not skill ready coming to the market. And I think that's what made us start these three new schools where we felt that we needed them to have skills in design, in communication, in management and in entrepreneurship. And I think that's so, so relevant now because Degrees give you really just a license to, to say that you have done your work in the universities, but I think the skill sets really give you the, the, 
knowledge for getting into your jobs and so on. So I'm going to go on to Radhika, continuing from what um, Anita just said. Um, she said there aren't enough skill sets for the talented young people there. Do you feel it's the same here in the United States? Also, um, what do you feel about the, uh, you know, what according to in your work are you feeling about the advancing of the rights for women and girls? So the two questions in one. Okay, well I guess first I should start with what my office does, which is we work to advance women's issues through US foreign policy and we focus on four issues. One of which is working with adolescent girls to empower them. So, you know, if we don't start young and we don't address the needs that adolescent girls face, it sets them up for a trajectory where they're not succeeding or thriving. And that doesn't just hurt the girls, it certainly hurts the girls, but it also hurts their communities and it hurts society writ large. There are 700 million women today on, uh, in the world that were married under, you know, as children. And each year, 15 million girls are married. And that sets up a cycle of poverty, cycles of um, a lot of issues. So that's um, one of our office's key primary focus areas. We're also looking um, at economic empowerment and the prevention and response to gender-based violence. And reflecting more on my work, because it's focused um, internationally, um, I wouldn't want to speak necessarily to the domestic issues. Um, has there been progress? Yes. There's more laws on the books today uh, related to various women's issues than any other time on earth. But enforcement is a key barrier to actually making progress. Um, if I look, we've now there's a recognition that women are critical to peace and security because there's so much evidence that shows that. If you just reflect on history, a lot of what we're, we do is share you know, the 1998 um, Good Friday Agreement that took place in Ireland. It happened because women were at the negotiating table. They helped uh, the negotiations go on when ceasefires broke down. They helped negotiate the release of political prisoners um, and the reintegration of those prisoners into society. And that's real peace building work that happens when women are present and when they're active. The same could be said of Uganda, the same could be said of Darfur where women have been active. And are women more and more active in that realm? Since 1992, actually, there's only been a 2% of women, 3% of women mediators in peace processes and 8% nego as negotiators in peace processes. So yes, there's been some progress, but a lot more needs to be done. So Anjali, I'm going to go across to you, just taking on <coughs> what you said, that women and girls make up almost half of the world's population, yet too often their voices and experiences go unheard and unheeded. What role can media proactively play in creating more balance in this cross underrepresentation? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and I just want to reply to something quickly that yeah. he said. Um, the idea of mediators, I think it's funny because we, we know that women play a role at home between, you know, mother-in-laws and families and children. And, and the, the mediation is part of the home life, so it's really interesting to see that that doesn't translate necessarily into, into uh, the work. But um, on, on that note, uh, the, the idea of how, how the media can play a role, I know uh, Radhika, as part of uh, Mahindra, you might know about She the People TV. Yeah, so we have outlets, and over here we have the skim. We have outlets that are focusing so much more on what women are doing, how they're doing it, um, making sure to recognize uh, any women who are making advancements or sitting at top level jobs. And the more publications that come out focusing on that, I think the better it is because you, I mean, the other side of that too, right, is that you can argue that why separate us from the rest? If we're half the population, why should we focus separately on women? And it's because they've been so underrepresented and so underappreciated that in order to kind of balance it out, I think you have to push all the way on the other side of the scale for something like that to happen. So I think that um, just more recognition in the media is, is helpful, more publications focused, or even blogs that are coming out, not just on women as a whole, but it even like goes down to the granular level. You're looking at different communities. You have women um, in um, LGBT, LGBT communities. You have women in minority communities. You have so many different aspects um, that are being focused on, and 
larger media companies are now starting to focus on that. They are bringing up blogs. They are bringing up special sections dedicated to women and, and their work. So the more that we do that, I think the better off we're going to be. Radhika, I'm going to come back to you and say as the president of the Ladies' Wing, were you able to proactively do a lot more in this field? Um, for from the point of view of the women, yes, and, and business and entrepreneurship, yes, yes we are doing. Um, we are trying to give a lot of platform more to the women so that we have sustainable revenue models. We don't want to do it in the NGO um, track because I think there are a lot of NGOs, a lot of people who are already doing a lot of very good work in social activity there. But I think to create a, a sustainable revenue model, particularly in the rural areas, is what has been a lot of focus of ours. We have got a village we've adopted, a Ganeshwar village in Maharashtra. We have made 79 toilets because they didn't have toilets. And hygiene, healthcare is such a big issue. They have to go to the well, bring the water. We've given them connectivity with pipes so that the water comes in from the well into their homes. And this is honestly just two hours outside Mumbai where we're doing this. And you don't have that kind of, you know, basic facilities for them. And we have adopted that village. We are doing a lot of work now. Now we are working to try and make them get with the Aadhaar cards and get digitally um, more empowered. But so that's one thing we do. We encourage a lot of um, women entrepreneurs in the rural areas to come out by giving awards, by looking uh, you know, in ways to help them and encourage them. And um, we do give that platform also where we have workshops, we have seminars. So if you do want to start small scale business businesses, then we tell you, you can come in and we help you from the legal point of view, from a financial point of view, what you need to do, how do you need to go about it, and do give you the basic infrastructure to move forward and get on with that. Thank you, Radhika. That's very interesting. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, one of the things we were brainstorming on this visit here with so many of us being around, academics being around, and we said, we've never introduced, we've always introduced courses on leadership, and uh, it's always taken that this, that, that is for men, but so we thought that we're going to specifically introduce one women in leadership. And that's going to be something new that we want to introduce because we feel there are definitely, as you're all saying, uh, special skill sets which women bring to the workplace. Um, Abanti, you would be very happy to know that uh, Daryl has very effectively put in many, many, many networking sessions in today's uh, program. And that's very interesting to see. So I would like to know, Abanti, from you that, as we can see, networking is a very important skill. Um, are there networks and other groups that women should leverage while they are visiting India? Yeah, absolutely they should. Um, simply because um, India is a large and complex country, society. Um, in business terms, we say India is an insider's market, which means, you know, you really need to, um, you know, have kind of embedded knowledge and insights about the country. So I think it's very important uh, that, you know, women or men who are visiting India, particularly on work or business, uh, tap into uh, local insights and local knowledge, for which, therefore, networking and access to networks is absolutely crucial. The good thing is that even for women, while we may be underrepresented still in business and corporate boardrooms, there are women's networks which are, uh, which are alive and quite kicking and robust. Some of these are web and digital based, but there are others which are actual sort of physical forums. Um, some of them are actually um, supported by Apex chambers, like you know the kind that Radhika is, is, is a part of. And then there are other networks as well, which represent and uh, allow you to connect with professional women, women entrepreneurs, uh, and so on. So yes, um, absolutely those are there. Thank you. Rajiv. One legislative change which should be made to ensure level playing field for women socially, economically, and politically. Uh, so I don't actually think there can be just one legislative change that oh, I'm glad you that. mean. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that 
that, uh, especially here in the United States, people have tried, and there's employment laws and other laws that have tried, and they've, they've, there's been some incremental progress uh, to try to level the playing field. But ultimately, I don't think any single legislative solution can do it. The, the buzzword recently is, is an Equal Pay Act. And so Iceland is, I think, the only country in the world, uh, maybe a couple months ago, that passed an Equal Pay Act, where it's actually the law now that if a man is paid a certain wage, then a woman has to be paid the same wage. Otherwise, it's against the law. That's interesting. I think that's, that's, that's yeah. a very good thing that that's yeah. happened. And Iceland, by the way, as a, as a complete aside, was the first uh, country in the modern age to have a democratically elected woman in charge of the country. So it's very interesting, actually. Iceland is a kind of a standout. It's a great that. example. But, you know, the EU has uh, regulations on the books. It's part of their, the EU constitution. And other countries have, have these types of concepts that men and women should be treated equal at all levels as part of their, their legislative schemes. But there's really not any one law that can do it. And I think, you know, we heard from Caddy earlier there's so many different things that everyone can do. So legislative change, I think, is one component of trying to equal the playing field. And an Equal Pay Act in the United States would definitely um, help move that ball forward. But networking, which is what we were just talking about, is another component. And all of the people in this room who are leaders in their field, if they just pick up one person that works with them or for them and tries to elevate them to give them a skill set or give them something to level the playing field, I think each of those things um, in addition to everything all of you do and the, the outreach and the community events and the, the social welfare that everyone does will eventually equal the playing field. Good, great. How many of you have visited Iceland? Must go. Because Iceland that does not just have equal pay for men and women, but it's got the Blue Lagoon, which no other part of the world has. Isn't there a deal um, going on or something like that? There's a package of some oh, sort. Oh, there is a yeah, there that's, that's the next place. That, that Daryl's just decided that's where we're going to have the next <laughs> conference. Um, talking about, let, um, let me tell you, Abhanti, that Daryl has brought in many delegations to India as friends of India. And I think one of the topics that's been hot for them at every delegation is what, must, what are the considerations a foreign investor must have for mar market entry in India? And you could couple up this with saying, um, how do you really do business in India? And what's the kind of uh, uh, help they need? Or what should they be really looking for? Abanti, yours. yours. Yeah. So uh, let me go back to the point that I made about India uh, being a complex uh, country and therefore, you know, an insider's market. So I would say the first thing that anyone who's coming into India to do business should do is really tap into um, some local uh, sources of insights, understanding, knowledge, etc. Uh, there are different ways to do it. You can either do it through people that you recruit for, for your business. It could be through an advisory board. It could be through having a couple of local external consultants. So the source of the insights and understanding could vary. Uh, but that is absolutely something that's important for a country like India. I think the next thing I would say that's important is being really, really clear about what is the business objective for, for that particular venture? Uh, and what is the objective in the first two years, in the next three years, and so on? And the reason I say that is because you could either go for, uh, you know, expa for, for large size and scale in a country like India. That's one of the big reasons uh, to look at a country like India, actually. So scale uh, and top line, as we call it, sales could be one good objective. But the other could also be profit uh, and margins. And the two don't always go hand in hand, particularly in the early phase of business. So being really, really clear about what the business objectives are uh, and being clear about that upfront is really important. The third thing I would say is um, choose your battlegrounds and choose the territory or the state uh, versus choosing a whole country, again, given the size and sheer complexity of the country. Uh, it's a big ocean to boil, and therefore it's good as a business to say, I'm going to first prioritize X, Y, Z states and really take a state by state or sometimes even a city by city approach versus looking at the whole country. And finally, I think a good understanding of, the, of regulation is very, very fundamental to doing any business in India. Um, and, and I would say those are the four things uh, in those. 
Thank you so much. And I must tell you, you don't have to worry about the language because everybody speaks English. That's so that's right. something that, that, that's very useful. Uh, so I'm just going to go to Radhika for a minute. But before that, I want to tell my husband, who's sitting right there. S Sunita, probably you can see him, right? Um, I, that's it. <laughs> And he's looking so nervous. I think I'm quite doing well. Don't you yes. feel I'm doing well? Yes. You. <laughs> Can he relax a bit? I'm feeling very nervous looking at you. De <laughs> Dean, you're sitting next to him. Please, please just help him relax. I think I'm doing quite well. I've got my notes. I've done everything properly. All right. So let's go, let's, let's go on to Radhika. Radhika, just taking on from where, what uh, Avanti said, um, do you find uh, a similar situation for for doing businesses in South Asia, for other countries. How is it? Is the ease of entry easier? Because India is about one thirtieth. Abanti, correct me, one thirtieth or something on 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 a, out of a three hundred and fifty eight ranking for doing uh, business ease in India. I think right. maybe this is where Ranjit can correct me because he made more notes than I did. All right, so go on, Radhika. Well, I want to bring it back to women, actually, and also going back to what you were talking about. At the, the World Bank does a really interesting report on women business and the law. And they actually show that there's more than 100 economies around the world where there's at least one law that impedes women from starting, running, or scaling their businesses. And if you haven't seen that report, I really strongly urge you to. Um, I think India is a place where there are challenges for women to enter the workforce. The female labor force participation rate has actually been declining since 2012. Um, and that has um, some impact on the potential to grow. You were talking about the impact of a one percentage point increase and what that would do for India's economy. And um, McKinsey's Global Institute recently did a report where they showed that if India provided parity for women in the workforce, meaning they brought the level of female labor force participation to equivalent rates as men, the economy would grow by 16% over the next 10 years. And that's significant growth. Um, and how do you get there? I think the mentoring and the networks that you were talking about are really important. Access to capital is something that's critical. Um, in our office, actually, I want it's sort of tying in a, a bunch of things. We're looking at how we can Governments alone cannot do it. You need private sector inclusive economies. You need civil society. Um, so we have fostered a lot of partnerships to accelerate, um, accelerate the growth and momentum of this idea of the need for everyone to work together. One is a really uh, interesting partnership with Kiva, um, which is a crowdfunding platform. But actually, we're working with private companies so that donors can give $250,000 to this fund. And dollar for dollar, they're matched by loans that are raised online. And that goes towards helping women um, in India and around the world. Uh, we're working with Malop in India uh, to start and scale businesses at the small and medium enterprise level, which is really where we see a huge drop off in productivity and growth for women owned enterprises. So I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it, but It but did. In fact, I'm going to take it on to Anita. Um, Anita, uh, you know, she talked about. Uh, inclusion and diversity here and then you know making it easier for them to do business for women what do you feel about the corporate india is corporate india ready for doing this so uh, you know corporate india is still very far away uh, you know if i were to broadly sort of generalize and say you know how is corporate india doing on diversity and inclusion i would say we are very far away from uh, you know what Radhika just pointed out that, you know, it could uh, help us grow by 16%. Um, so, you know, there is, of course, there are some steps that have been taken in terms of bringing mm -hmm. more women entrepreneurs, you know, we, you know, getting them more uh, money, more funding. There are some steps being taken, but we are still very, very far away from that situation where we can say we are doing as well as, you know, some other countries. Uh, you know, even in, even if I were to look at some sectors, um, you know, I would say the technology sector or the business process sector has done better than other sectors in this uh, in this area because you see there is you know, in terms of entry level positions, you will see more women uh, in these companies, and there are steps being taken for bringing women back from maternity you know, creating those networks internally, giving them the support and coaching internally. 
but it's happening in a very sporadic, uh, you know, very limited way because if you really think about it, a lot of business leaders will say it's very important to have women in the workplace. It's very important to bring them to the board level, very important to have them in the leadership levels. But, you know, it's about putting the money where the mouth is. That doesn't happen so much. So it happens, but, you know, some evolved uh, sectors, like, like I pointed out, uh, it happens. But we are still very, very far away. So one company that stands out, which, you know, I've studied recently, is Wipro. Wipro is looking at diversity and inclusion in a very big way. And it has, you know, provided for daycare centers, you know, a longer maternity leave, uh, more inclusion in, uh, you know, mid-level to senior mid-level jobs. And also they're looking at a broader inclusion uh, agenda to include, you know, people with disabilities, uh, people from lower economic backgrounds. So, you know, but those are very few examples. So we really have to do a lot more, you know, for us to say, you know, we've reached a level where, you know, women can contribute to uh, our GDP in a bigger way. So Anita, I think one of, the, one of the sectors, and I'm sure Sue will agree with me on this, especially in India, one of the sectors is education, where we have more women. Uh, in, in our academics, whether it's school education or it's, uh, you know, university education, we have more women. And sometimes I have to have reservation for men in the schools, yes. <laughs> right? And that's yes. why we really treasure our men in our institutions, like the dean of our uh, school. Come on, I thought the staff there will give a big hand to the dean over there. Come on, what, is, what are they doing? Do we have to keep you awake. I don't, I don't see you all clapping. I need one more round of applause for the dean. Come on. I don't see them doing it. So, so Indu, I'd like to highlight something. You know, one of our investing companies for our fund is an education company. And uh, we have preschools and K kindergarten to 12th grade schools in this company. And all the preschools are franchised. And all these franchise schools are owned and run by women yeah, and very young exactly. women. Yes. So we love it. You know, we think it's a great diversity, uh, you know, example. So I missed that. So thank you for reminding me. So great. In, thank in fact, it was our first prime minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who said, you educate a man and you educate one person, but you educate a woman and you yes. educate an entire village. And I think that's that that's what we are very happy to see, that there are so many women in education today. The men are also doing well, so we, we, we are happy that they would be joining us. Um, I'm going to ask one little lighthearted question, and I've been dying to ask this question to Rajiv. Before I open it up for you people to ask just two questions, one to any of these panelists here and one to the other panelists, because we're going to actually wind up by a quick round of a story that they should say, and the lesson learned. And each one of them is going to say that before we end it. But before we do that and open it up to, please think about your questions that you have. Let me ask Rajiv this question. A fly on the wall tells me, you had a run-in with the legendary Rocky Sylvester Stallone. Can you share with us what this thought taught you about litigation between two unequals. The small fan of the famous film star who purposely stole his idea to make a film, and the big guy with the backing of a big and famous studio. All yours, Rajiv. Right, so what, what Indu's talking about is a lawsuit that our firm is involved in where uh, our client uh, wrote the script for a movie called Creed. And, uh, it's not the same as the movie that was produced, but he did pitch that movie through a variety of things, and the litigation's ongoing. Um, but you know, it's 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 an it's an interesting concept, which is the idea of don't ever back down because you think someone's bigger than you, um, and that's the way we practice law with our partnership, and it's the way that I've always tried to do things in my life, which is that if you think you're doing something right and you feel that you're doing it with conviction, then fight. And don't be afraid of raising your voice and don't be afraid of, of trying to do what you think is the right thing. Uh, because whether you win or lose, as, as long as you've tried, you've won. And if you don't try at all, just like if you don't raise your hand or if you don't ask for the raise or all the things that we've already talked about today, 
you're never going to know whether you win or lose. So getting in the fight is, is half the battle. So are you all set for taking on Shah Rukh Khan in India? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So we just offered him uh, some space, and we said, come and use our space in the school, the law, because we have a number of law firms in our schools, and it'll be lovely to have them. So ladies, are you ready with a couple of questions quickly? <laughs> the first hand's gone up here. Do you want to ask the Indian panelists, or you want to ask them? Uh, and their microphone. Can we give her a What's that? They're, they're right there. No, first, yeah, come there, come there. Tamara, come here and orchestrate people. <laughs> I personally think that... You the put the mic down to your... <laughs> Loudly. And can you introduce yourself? I feel that the women's rights are the human rights. And it is not just an Indian issue, but it is a global issue. So the corporate responsibility is there in India as well as here. But I think the education is the key. Like you said, the Gandhiji has said, if you educate the woman, she can educate the whole family. But I think the education must start when the children are little. So teaching them about the gender, gender equality and equity is very important. At so, a young age, I understand. So, so is what, that a comment, or should I tell somebody to ask uh, a comment no, on so it? No, so I have a question. That yes. As a woman organization over here, uh, all the dignitaries sitting over there, how are you addressing the issue over here? Not just to the Indian community, let's open up for the entire community. And so I'm gonna ask Radhika that. Uh, our office focus, focuses globally, and to address the point of education, we launched, the US government launched a strategy um, on adolescent girls, specifically to get to this root issue, which is focusing on secondary education. Um, we're looking at the barriers to secondary education and how to keep girls in school, not just in India, but around the world. And we've launched four focus countries for that initiative, um, Laos, Nepal, Tanzania, and Malawi. And working with governments, UN organizations, um, a host of players to support girls. One more, Sunita, all yours. Uh, Radhika, the question is to you. Um, in light of the fact that we are now in a very misogynistic environment here, uh, where women's reproductive rights are negatively impacted and uh, women are being demeaned at every level, do you anticipate policy changes down the pike where there might be some defunding of uh, some of the work you're doing? And or do you see, have a sense that there is some enforcement that is affecting your work already? So the work of the State Department vis-a-vis -vis women and girls has remained unchanged um, in terms of our policy priorities and what we're looking at. Certainly changes to uh, global health programming as it relates to reproductive health care have changed. Um, our office's work has not. And we are launching an initiative next week actually in India where we're pulling together for the first time a women's conclave we have 10 uh, state ministers of women's affairs coming together from northern India to look at gender-based violence and women's security, both economic as well as physical security. It's the first time we're doing that as a government. So I think um, there are certainly changes, but we are continuing. And if I could jump in on that question also, you know, having worked with Democrats around the country, um, I think the Democrats in general, and even within the state, are very concerned about those issues. So I can tell you that right now within New Jersey, for those of you that live here, there's a gubernatorial election going on, and the primary election is very soon. But the Democrats in particular have been focusing on if things change at the federal level, where, where women's health care is impacted, what is it that the state can do within the state government in terms of policy, legislative action, resources, to try to close the gap? Now that may be, there may be issues in other parts of the country that don't get addressed as well, but within, within the confines of the state here, people are working very diligently um, on trying to protect against the very things that, that it seems that you're concerned about and I'm definitely concerned about. Uh, if I question. could, <clears throat> we are privileged in New Jersey to have a very large segment of the Southeast Asian population, which I think enriches us tremendously. And with the fastest growing 
city outside of Delhi being Edison, New Jersey. <laughs> it's very well punctuated. And this is open to both groups. What are the nuances that you see that we can build on, on broad-based issues concerning women that come out of the South Asian culture in the United States, as opposed to those nuances that come out from India? So it's a question that I'd, anyone who wanted to answer on both sides of the pond, I think we need to understand what can we build on? There's so many similarities, and yet there are differentials. So what are the similarities and what are the issues that we can work as teams on? I mean, I guess I, should, I could start. I've traveled extensively across South Asia for work, and I've yet to go to a country where there aren't government officials, people in the private sector, people in civil society who are actively working to promote US-South Asia ties, but also focused on women and girls. So, the people-to-people -people ties between India and the United States alone accounts for $100 billion in trade and investment annually. And that is something that, if we bring a gender lens to, could yield significant dividends for women and girls, which is why we're actually looking so closely at sub-national engagement, bringing states and cities from both um, India and the United States together to foster a focus on women and girls. Because there is so much expertise in these countries related to key issues that we face here in the United States. It's not just a one-way street. There's a, a lot of exchange. By nature, um, India has come up with incredible solutions for women and girls that would benefit um, women and girls here in the United States. Pakistan has one of in Punjab province, where 75% of the gender-based violence is reported annually, is launching an incredible initiative to support the prevention and response to gender-based violence. It's one of the most comprehensive in the region. And actually, Norway is looking at that as a model that it could bring in. So I think there's learning that can go both ways um, on a range of women's issues. And that's something that we are looking at at the State Department. Yeah, yes. right. exactly. Similar to what we're doing here today. All right, so we're just going to have a quick round of just try and keep it very short about something that you want to say, a story, share a story, and a lesson learned. Anita, can we start with you? Yes, so I wanted to share uh, a story of, um, you know, this bunch of kids uh, from uh, IIT Bombay, which is a technology institute. They. Uh, they came up with this social enterprise, which was directed at women empowerment. And I was very privileged to mentor them, and I was part of this process. So I don't know how many of you know, but uh, incense sticks are a big deal in India because of worship that we do in temples and at home. And incense sticks are actually rolled by women in very, very poor areas of India. Um, and this is charcoal waste that is uh, used to roll these incense sticks. And in a day, a woman can probably roll 100 incense sticks, and these then are you know, sort of consolidated and bought by large organizations where they are dipped in fragrances and then sold in the market. But the woman at the end of it doesn't really make any money, and because of the charcoal waste, they have very, very poor respiratory uh, you know, situations. So these bunch of kids actually came up with a completely alternative, safe uh, ingredient for these incense sticks. So it was sugarcane waste, which was mixed with some chemicals, and it was exactly the same as charcoal waste. And uh, they also came up with a device which helped the woman roll 10,000 sticks in a day versus 100 sticks in a day. Mm, that's so, um, really great. you know, when I was... Uh, when I was mentoring these, these kids, uh, you know, this machine costs about maybe 10,000 rupees, which is a lot of money for these women. So we went to banks, to rural banks, and we came up with this, uh, you know, arrangement with the banks that they would provide a very, very low interest loan to these women uh, so that they could buy the, the, this device and they could roll these sticks. And my question to these kids was, uh, is there so much demand for, you know, so many incense sticks? And they said, you have no idea. These women work day and night, and so this really simplifies their life. So I can say I was proud to be a mentor to this, uh, you know, to these kids, and they made a big difference. So, you know. Thank you. Uh, just That's a great share. story of social impact, right? Um, amazing story. Thank you. 
I'm going to come back here to Radhika. Radhika, you, and then we go to the Radhika in India. Come on. Um, so one story that keeps coming to my mind, my former boss, her name was Milan Verveer, and she was the first US ambassador at large for global women's issues. And we were sitting around a table sort of talking about what is it that is holding women back? Like if you look at it, no matter what country you go to, no matter where you are, what sector, sphere you see, this persistent um, trend that women are not necessarily at the table. And she just sort of was looking and turned to me and said, you know, you sh waiting for you to get power, it's just never going to happen. No one will ever give you power. You just have to take that. And it struck me as something that I think, specifically because Caddy was talking so much about the confidence gap and what that means and how to actually um, foster that. And I think that's the next frontier in this work, is looking at that inner dimension of what it is that we can do to flip the switch. It's policy, it's regulation, it's bosses that give you a lift, but it's also something that's very personal. And I think that that is like, in this work of gender equality, we need to shift. So the Indian goddesses would call it the inner shakti, yeah. right? So that's what we're looking for. Radhika Nath. Um, I think one of the, I mean, there's so many stories and lessons I'm sure all of us have got, but I think one of the recent ones which is, comes, comes to me from my past year of being um, the president of the Indian Merchants Chamber has been how the um, ladies wing, when you get together and women are inclusive, and you uh, come together to do anything, the amazing power women have together. And I think we don't realize that because to me it was a revelation. I've always seen women with politics among themselves, competition, and it's always been touted like that. But I think it, it is a top-down effect that if you actually encourage people to come together and say, let's work and do things together, I think women are amazing. And one of the biggest examples I had of this is when we've tied up with the, um, one of my passions is safe cities for women and safety of women. And we've tied up with the Indian Police Foundation and actually working with the police. And we put a very eclectic group of women together from all walks of life, from an activist to an educationist to uh, people who are actually working in child trafficking, hands down NGOs. And it was amazing now we're going across 22 cities taking best practices from, because it like, um, uh, you know, it was just said how complex everything is, Abnita, you were saying. It's amazing that um, you have, to, what happens in Bangalore is different to what happens in Delhi. The mindset of Haryana is completely different to a Keralite. These are the so different you states. Take, yeah, take the best practices from everywhere is what's working. And we are hoping to put a, a policy paper together, give it to the government and hope it gets taken notice of. But to me, it's been a revelation to see that you harness that power women have and get them to work together. It's amazing. I think that, so. that actually endorses what Daryl does. I think the power of women together, and she's been doing this for many years. And Radhika, you've been doing it now. And I'm sure I can see a lot of girls in, in the audience in Mumbai. I'm sure they'd love to join hands with you and please include them in your projects. We'd love to have young students do it. Anando, do you agree with that? That's one of our faculty right at the, can you hear us, Anando? He can't probably, anyway. So now let's get back to Anjali. Yes. We're gonna give the gentleman the last word, okay? <laughs> no pressure. Um, so the story that I'm going to share is actually very personal, and I think that there, I know that I'm not the only one. I know that this goes across um, cultural lines and also um, does get reflected across the country and across the world. But when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a very conservative household. And what that means is that from literally the time I was born, I was told I'm going to grow up and I'm going to get married, I'm going to have kids, and it's all going to be great. And basically an education was just something I could put on what we call biodata, but like on my resume for getting married essentially. Like that's the sole purpose of what a woman in my family got educated for. Nobody up until me, nobody in my family has used their education towards a career. And so I noticed that growing up, 
And I was still convinced that that was the route that I was going to take. I never thought to myself that I would be sitting here today. Um, and it's, I've been very lucky in meeting the right people at the right time, having the right mentors, or even just friends who challenged me and mm. asked me why I accepted that and who told me that I have another option. When I was in the ninth grade, I had an English professor who, um, I, I remember saying something along the lines of, yeah, that's gonna be my life, and he was like, why? You're in America now. And I was like, excuse me, don't insult me and my culture that way. You don't have the right to. And I was so mad at him at that time. And yet, as I got through the years, I think I started getting you know, rebellious in that respect. But it got to the point where I, I finally had, the, over the years, I built up to the point where I could stand up to my parents and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be fulfilling this dream for you. Um, at least not on your terms, it's going to be on mine. And from that point on, I started noticing how much happier I was and noticing how much more motivated um, I could be in the workplace as well. And that has helped me tremendously just in my career in general. So. Thank you. That's well said. Well said. And I, and I think you reflect uh, the dilemma of a lot of the Indian girls too. Who, who would be in the similar situation. But please don't give up on marriage because a lucky <laughs> young man must get you. You're a wonderful young lady, right? Let's give her a hand for that. So we've got Abanti and then we've got Raj. Come on, Abanti, your story. Okay, so mine is going to be a little bit of a business context story. Um, so you would remember that I said uh, the alcohol industry in India is, is not exactly... Um, rose, uh, all roses and, and uh, you know, good stuff. Um, and one of the things that's not great about this industry is that there aren't very many women who work in this industry. So uh, when I was managing director of Diageo in India, uh, I inherited a leadership team, an extended leadership team, um, where there were hardly any women. So in a team of 30, there must have been two um, or so. And within about a year and a half, um, we actually managed to get about 12 or 15 thereabouts, which, uh, which was important um, because you know, these were women who were actually in the extended leadership team and had very key roles to perform. So there were two lessons that I learned out of, out of that process. Um, one was to the oft-asked question about you know, what is it that makes women want to work in a company? I realized that the simple answer really at one level, very simple at a level, was you uh, give um, the right culture and the right environment within a business um, and then just get a few women in, uh, see them flourish within that culture, um, and then they will be like magnets who will attract other women. And that's exactly what happened. So there wasn't any great affirmative action there wasn't anything that I believe we did, uh, we, we did um, out of the way, uh, but we just created the right culture, the right enablers, and, and, and we had uh, you know, a larger number of women in leadership. And the second lesson that I learned was um, how having women, particularly in male-dominated companies or industries, gives a very big reputational, positive reputational rub-off to the company. Uh, because I started hearing uh, from outside, outside of the company about Diageo and how it is a very progressive company. Uh, it must be, you know, very, very um, uh, ethical in its conduct in what is often seen as a murky industry. And all of the stuff which really helped us have a much enhanced reputation. And women, having women in key leadership roles played a big, uh, big part of that. So those were the two lessons that I took out of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this. Rajiv, all yours. I sure. think she deserves a real. Um, I think the lesson learned there is building a culture and creating enablers. I think all of us have to do it wherever we are. So I have, I have two stories, actually. And I think one that's very relevant here and one that's a little probably more relevant in India. But I'll share both of them. So, you know, I end up going to a lot of events. And I'm Can sure you many... hear him? Can you all hear him? No, no. they can't okay. hear him. Louder. That's better? Okay. Yeah. So I, as many of you in this room, I'm sure you go to a lot of events in the evening. 
you know, whether it's a networking event, a business event, a client dinner, whatever it may be. And I have a running joke, although it's really not a funny joke, uh, with many of my female friends and colleagues that I see at these events, that whenever we walk into a room, men, usually older men or men that are middle-aged men, will come up to them and say, oh, who's watching your kids tonight? I've never been asked that question. And, and, and my wife works, and she's great, and, and we, we share responsibilities. But I've never been asked that question. And I just got a text message last night from a friend who said, you will not believe it. I went to this event, and this guy that I've known for 15 years said, oh, did you get a sitter for the kids tonight? Or, or who's taking care of the kids tonight? And it's just such an odd thing. And, and to me, the lesson learned from that is that you can't just be quiet and let that go. And, and Many of the women I know don't feel comfortable pushing back in this circumstance because of who the other person is, so they've recruited me to do that. And so I'll I'd happily, <laughs> gladly do it, because Absolutely. it just seems so odd and unusual. And you get paid for um, it. And, and I, I saw the shock on half the faces in this room, but it happens, and I'm sure it's happened to many of you. So that's one, one story and one lesson learned. Um, the other one is, is you know, uh, it's a personal story for me. And so in the mid-1960s, there was an, a woman who lived in Mumbai who was the first person in her family to go to college. And uh, she wasn't married and had gotten her first graduate degree and decided to get on, the pl on a plane with one green suitcase and $100 to come to the United States. And she knew one person here, literally. When she got off the plane, that person picked her up. And she had gotten into a master's program in New York City and decided that despite no one from her family having growing up kind of poor, uh, had never really gotten through to that level of college, and none, none of the women, she had many older sisters in her family, had gone to college even, um, but that she was actually going to take this very major cross transatlantic trip in the mid-60s, come to somewhere where she didn't know anyone, unmarried, as you said, which was unusual definitely at that time, uh, and start a life. And that idea of trailblazing, which is something I talked about earlier briefly, is so important. And it's important, I think, for everybody out in India, and really for everyone here, that you know, whether you're a woman or a man, and wherever you come from, whatever your, your heritage is, or whatever circumstances you grow up in, you have the ability within yourself to blaze that trail. And that person is my mother, um, oh, and wow. I have lots to, to thank her for because of that. But um, I think that that's, you know, to me, that's a lesson learned, which is that if you really put your mind and your heart to do something, you can really do whatever, whatever it is that you want to achieve. Thank you. That's a beautiful story. And, um, you know, it's amazing how there are many such examples like your mother's, and we see them all the time. The only thing that I didn't believe was that when you said that she came here with one suitcase. It was and one green suitcase. <laughs> Indians don't travel light. Indians don't travel light. I'm sorry. Just, just lightheartedness. Of course. So we, we've, had, we've had all the stories. <laughs> I'm going to just end with my last story, and this is a true story. And I felt I must share it here today. It just happened the week that I was leaving for the United States. We have a program, a one-year master's program, which is called the MBE, Management, Business, and Entrepreneurship. We're away from the MBAs now because we want to produce entrepreneurs. 23 million babies are born every year in India, and only 2 million jobs are being created. So we need to create more entrepreneurs. So we've started a school of entrepreneurship. So we had this challenge going on, which is called the ISMI. Our, our school is called Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship, and the entrance exam is called a challenge. And this, the students come and they do the challenge. And there was one question, uh, one answer paper that was brought to me to say that this answer paper has stopped the, the entrance test. But the girl, young lady, wants to meet you. And I said, sure, I'd love to see this young lady and see, you know, what a, what a wonderful way that she's got these great, uh, you know, al already got such great uh, grades on her entrance exam. And a very young, confident girl walked into my office. And I said, why do you want to do the entrepreneurship program? And she says, I want to do the entrepreneurship program because I want to create successful business where I can share the profits with people who are like me and have never had, would never get the opportunity to study. And I said, why? What's, what's wrong? And she says, my mother is a domestic help, and she cleans floors. 
and she has brought me up on her paltry doing three houses she goes to from morning to late night and she's been able to save up a little bit of money. I can't pay the full fees. I don't want a scholarship. I'll take a loan. I'll pay back. But I want to create a business so that I can make young women like me who would never have an opportunity to study, I would want them to study. This young girl today is in the audience. Can we have Shraddha come out, please, in the center? Can Sonia or somebody please bring Shraddha in the front? <laughs> Dean, can you bring her in the front, please? <laughs> come, Shraddha, come right here. Come, can we have you sitting on the chair? Shraddha, can you sit next to Anita? Can sit next to Anita or next to Abanti? <laughs> Anything. Here's a young lady, Shraddha. Give her a big hand. She's done her. <laughs> Shraddha, and I, I, I said to her, what do you feel about it? She says, you know, none of you feel as proud of your mother as I feel as proud of my mother. Can I bring her to meet you? And she brought her. And she's brought her here. Is your mother here, Shraddha? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, why don't you bring her? Oh, there she is. She's sitting on the right. Can, you, can she stand up so everybody can see her? Aap khade ho jau. Namaste. Can you all say namaste to her loudly? Namaste. Shraddha, do you want to say something? Come, stand up. Yeah. This is a very emotional moment for me. So I have no words. But I would like to thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. And it's me. What do you want to do after this? I want to start a, I want to work in the field of education. I want to start my own business. So my education was funded by an organization. And this is the time for me to give it back to the in society. Good. I think a big, big round of applause. She's very emotional at the moment. And this is the lesson that we want to share with all of you here, is that we have such aspirational young people in India for whom education, as you would all say, is the most important thing. And we educators want to make it, create world-class institutions back home so that we can give them that education. This young girl may never be able to travel to the United States, but I think after today, Daryl, we're going to see to it that you will do something for her. You've got so many <laughs> women over here. And, and not just that, you've done that in the past. One of the young ladies who similarly had come, in to, come and studied here for the scholarship is today working with the United Nations. And it's a proud moment for us. I think this is why we are here, because I think we want to learn your best practices and we want to create. We're happy to be associated with the New Jersey City University and many other universities who have opened their arms. We've had discussions with Harvard Business School. We went on to meet MIT Sloan School. We were with Pace University. We are at NYU Stern and Columbia. It was a very interesting thing to see how the students were given an excellent lecture by the Vice Dean of Columbia. And I think our students deserve it. Look at the aspirations they have. Look at the fire in their belly. And this is what we really want to light. And that's why we are here to join hands with you to bring the best education back home for us, for Shraddha. Give her a big hand. <laughs> and on this occasion, I must say, this is a book Again, a contribution by my dear husband, who felt that this would be the right book for the occasion to give out to all our panelists here. And may I request the, the Sonali and uh, the others to please hand out the similar book. You have three books there, so j books to them. Let me just read out. This book is called Three. Three means women, right? It says, Women of India. And let me read this out to say, Ayesha Talyar Khan, who's done this. It's just photographs. She has done this, a photo essay on women that will have universal appeal. The current book captures women in many avatars. The young working woman, sportswoman, many careers, 
business women, film artists, everyday women, carrying on everyday chores, the social life, the college student, and she's photographed them in stills in every aspect wherever she has been able to go. It's a beautiful book, and I think on behalf of all of us, first of all, may I request our Vice Dean, uh, Hina Takkar, to first present it. Can we have you upstairs, Daryl? You've done a lot for, and Sue, can we have you upstairs too? Stand in the center, yeah. That's it. Let's give her a big warm applause. She's always worked so hard. And to Sue. And can we give it now to the um, participants, panelists, panelists Radhika? Thank you. Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sue, all yours. You have an announcement here. Thank you. Daryl, keep, keep standing. Daryl, just keep waiting. Daryl, just keep waiting. Be doing one. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I want to thank all of you over at the uh, School of Design and uh, Entrepreneurship. We have been so privileged um, to begin talking with you, and I will tell you that um, Indu is very modest. She is an amazing entrepreneur herself. She did an amazing job at her last institution, HR College, where we collaborated with them and where our faculty went over and taught. And I am so pleased that we are now going to be able to work with your institution now. And today I have an MOU that I'd like for the oh, two of wow. us to sign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we also have the dean stand up there so that he can be a part of the MOU signing? Can we have the dean come right there? He's right here. So dean, we are signing an MOU with the New Jersey City University, the design school, the school of communication, and uh, can we have Anuja come up and stand next to the dean representing the uh, communication, school of communication? Where are you, Anuja? Come on, fast. Where are you? Right I, here, ma'am. Right where, here. Oh, I, I, right there. Okay. And we, have this, and we have the School of Entrepreneurship. Is Sonia and Sonali around? Can they please come up and represent? All right. There, there they are. So we're all signing on behalf of all of you. May I have our vice principal over here, please? Vice. Yes, and Tamara. And Shikha, please come up. Absolutely. A big round of applause for all of you. Big round of them. applause, please. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We would like to honor our Indian panelists as well. If I could please request Dean Mukesh Patel to please give a small token yeah, of appreciation. Yeah. To Ms. Abanti. And of course, Ms. Anita as well. Keep that round of applause going, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you very much for spending your evening with us here today. Thank Over you very to you, much. Ma